Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, our sponsor, the DeKalb Library Foundation, Reed SC, the South Carolina Center for the Book, we'd like to welcome you to another in our continuing series of virtual events that we started last year as we shut down due to the pandemic. We'd like to give you a special shout out to the DeKalb Library Foundation. That's the organization that pays for the Zoom account that is bringing us into your homes this evening. Just a few reminders about this evening. If you'd like to ask a question either during the presentation or after the presentation is over, either one of our speakers, please feel free to type your question in the Q&A tab or in the chat and we will answer those in turn. Don't be afraid to ask the question during the presentation. Um, John and Mashima have said that they would like to go ahead and have a discussion with everyone. So type those questions in as you think of them and, and we'll go ahead and, and let our hosts know. We'd also like to remind you about some upcoming events and you can find all of those on georgiacenterforthebook.org, our Facebook page, or on Eventbrite. On March 9th, we will host a talk with Joel C. Rosenberg for his new thriller, The Beirut Protocol. Elizabeth Passarella will give a talk on March 15th for her book called The Good Apple. We will have Rob Kenner on March 22nd in a panel discussion for his book called The Marathon Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nipsey Hussle. And on March 27th, 24th through 27th, we of course will host the Lost Southern Voices Festival. This is in collaboration with Georgia State University. And it is about reviving Southern authors and voices whose books have no longer been in print, their voices have fallen out of favor, or they're no longer widely read anymore. We will feature authors and scholars talking about William Gay, Helen Thomas Lewis, Augustus Longstreet, and we'll also feature a keynote speech by U.S. Poet Laureate Natasha Trethewey. You can find all of that information on our website and of course on Eventbrite. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book this evening, Black, White, and the Gray, you can do so from Karis Books. We'll have the link in the chat and you can order directly from them. They offer curbside pickup and they will also mail books home to you. Right now, of course, I'd like to introduce our two guests this evening. Masha Mavaley is the executive chef and partner at The Gray and The Gray Market. She was previously the head chef at Gabrielle Hamilton's beloved restaurant, Prune, and chairs the board of the Edna Lewis Foundation. She's been the subject of stories in USA Today, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Condé Nast Traveler, Food and Wine, Ebony, and Bon Appetit. She starred in an episode of Chef's Table and has won the James Beard Award for Best Chef in the Southeast. John Omar Asano, previously a media startup entrepreneur, is the founding partner at The Gray and The Gray Market. He oversaw the painstaking restoration of the dilapidated Greyhound bus station and directs the business operations. He has helped reshape and expand the mission of the Edna Lewis Foundation and serves as the board member and treasurer. Of course, this is a fantastic story. It's heartwarming and timely about two people who came together, forged a friendship and a business in an old dilapidated, formerly segregated Greyhound bus station. So I'd like to welcome tonight, Masha Mavaley and John Morisano. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank um, Joe and Allie for hosting us this evening um, and to everyone who's in attendance. Thanks for caring, I guess. Yeah, thanks for coming and listening to what we have to say and reading the book if you read the book. Thank you so much. Yeah, and um, what Joe said, like if you have any questions as we're talking, send them into the chat. Um, and we really enjoy conversation. So if, if this becomes more of a dialogue, um, it, it, it'll be fun. So we wanna open the evening um, by, we, I hate going to book events and, and they start reading, but we're going to do that because there's sort of an ulterior motive um, to get us into a conversation. And I'm also going to share my screen, if that's okay, as we're reading and so that everybody knows what we're reading about. Um, um, Joe, can you confirm that's up? That is up. All right. So um, I'm, I'll start. 
Mishama, after taking it in for a minute, reacted first. I love it, she said. It's perfect. I really thought it was perfect for the space. Smart, very smart. The postcard feel made with tra old trading stamps and stickers was not like a collage I had ever seen before. As I was taking it all in, I could feel Marcus staring at me almost as if he didn't believe, if he didn't believe that I liked it or my initial reaction was my true reaction. At that time, he didn't know me very well, but we'd get past all that. Thanks, Marcus said. Yeah, I'm happy with it. Marcus, a tall, skinny, pale guy with dark, curly hair and a perpetual five o'clock shadow, looked toward me. He touched the wide brim of his floppy felt hat nervously with one hand, repositioning the love beads that hung around his neck with the other, and asked, what do you think? I need to look at it some more, I said, offering no reaction at all. I looked at it for what felt like a solid five minutes before I said a word. It concerned me. It was provocative. At first glance, it was difficult for me to interpret it as racist or hopeful or both. I don't know, I said honestly. There's a lot going on in there. I'm not sure people will get it. That's what's great about it, Mishama offered. The black people in the front of the bus, all you have to do is see that to know what this thing is about. The rest of it is kind of a mind bend, I agree, but isn't that what art is supposed to do? Makes you think a little bit. I like the fact that you have to really look at it. If someone's first conclusion is that it's racist or saying something it's not saying, then I think we can deal with it. To heck with them if they can't take a joke, right? Marcus laughed, I laughed. I stood a few minutes longer. I do think it's perfect, Marcus, Mishama repeated. Finally, I came around. I love the piece, I do, I, I said, and I did. I would definitely hang this piece in my house, but I have to defer to you on this one for the restaurant, Mishama. If you think people are going to get it, I'm down. I think most people will get it, not all people though. A few weeks before seeing Marcus's piece, Jono and I had dinner at Local 1110, a beautiful restaurant housed in a old bank just south of Forsyth Park. Jono was sitting at the bar when I arrived, chatting with people who looked familiar to me, but I couldn't place. We were still excited to be together and a little nervous around each other, as you are at a new relationship slash partnership. I, slapped, I sat down right next to him, greeting the bartender and asking for a glass of whatever Jono was drinking. Not paying attention to his conversation, I sipped my wine as I waited for him to say his goodbyes. After I waited for him to say his goodbyes. Shortly after, shortly after settling into my seat, Jono turned to me and asked if I realized that I was a black woman in Savannah opening a chef driven restaurant. I was surprised, maybe even a little shocked by his phrasing and then wished I had paid attention to the conversation he was having as, he quest as his question seemed to be a result of it. Where was he going with this? Jono, I said calmly, I do realize I'm a black woman and a chef. Is that your question? I asked after taking another sip of wine. He went on to say, do you know what do you know what that will mean to people here? I wondered if this had to do with my food or my gender or my race. I was confused and I bet those people put some sort of doubt in his mind about one or more of those things. I was wondering if it was the first moment that he had been confronted with the power of stereotypes or the racism that might confront the gray. I wondered if he was truly up for the challenge of opening a restaurant with someone like me. I wondered if we would be up for the challenge of changing the stereotypes of business relationships in this city. Changing someone's ideas about race was a challenge that I was not up for. I was here to cook food and I wanted to say my piece that way. It's provocative. And it is definitely going to elicit reaction. We'll just have to be ready for that. I guess most people getting it will have to be good enough. Let's do it, Mishama said emphatically. 
I have to say, I was really gung-ho about this picture. I don't know <laughs> what it was that struck me, but it struck me almost immediately. And I can see the pause in it, right? I can I, I understand that there are parts of it that are really reminiscent of what traveling in the South was once upon a time, the Jim Crow era, all of that. I get I get that part of it. But really the idea of the way Marcus flipped the script, so to speak. He flipped the people in the bus. It wasn't on, it wasn't on planet Earth. It was somewhere else. Um, the family was multi multiracial, multicultural, and it just seemed like the future. And then the future was bright. It was a bright sunny day, their children playing, and all those things that sort of built up these Southern ideals didn't seem to matter. And it didn't seem to be a part of life and what people were resting their morals on. So I was just sort of very happy with the piece when I first saw it. Yeah, and the reason um, that we, we've read that at a few book events that we've done is it, it's really illustrative. And we're gonna, we're gonna go back in time kind of the way we do in the book in a few spots and, and talk about how we ended up in Savannah. But it's really illustrative of this fledgling relationship that Misham and I had, um, because at that point, that was August of 2014, we, Mishama moved to Savannah from New York in May of that year. Yeah. So she had only been in the city three or four months. Like we, we are not business partners who had spent a lifetime together and then decided to go into business together. We didn't know each other from Adam when we met in November of the previous year. And this sort of dance that you go through, um, like we didn't expect, I didn't expect, I shouldn't say we in this case, I didn't expect to have to confront issues like race and class and the differences between us and how we perceive the world, which is really what that whole um, episode in Marcus's studio meant to me, like we see the world differently. Like I saw it and I was like, I was afraid of it, right? I, I'm looking at it through my white kid from Staten Island lens and I couldn't make out that porter carrying the luggage and, you know, and, and all of it. And, um, and that, that day was like a moment that was really impactful where we went, oh, we're going to have to figure this out. It's going to take a while probably, but we're going to have to figure each other out and figure out the complexities of um, opening a restaurant in the South and both being from the North and, and, you know, and, and we ended up hanging that painting in the middle of our dining room like the way that came about is we went to Marcus who was a friend of mine and somebody Mishama immediately liked when she met him and he's like a really gifted artist we think and we went to him and we're like we just want a big splash of color in the middle of our dining room because the color palette is wood and earth tones and we want you to just like and he took it there. He took <laughs> it completely all the way to the last stop. And neither of neither one of us expected it, but I was so open to it because I felt, um, I just felt compelled by the whole thing. And I do think like that brings a really good point because there was so much about working with each other that was so unsaid. We, we really both dived into the deep end of the pool. And Jono was always, Jono was already there, sort of like, you know, treading water and trying to like get the team together and everything like that. But I was in the deep end. So it was very, um, it was a very overwhelming time. I had moved to Savannah I had lived in Savannah when I was a child, but I, I but I didn't, I wasn't really familiar with it in a, in a way of, um, as an adult where you have connections and you understand, you know, um, your, what your likes and your dislikes and where to go hang out and stuff like that. I wasn't really engaged with the city like that. So I was really um, kind of following him around trying to figure out, you know, what this restaurant was going to be and how we were going to staff it and what, you know, trying to figure out what the culture was between the two of us. And so that was a really important moment because we realized that we needed to sit down and really talk about what the expectations were other than we want good food. You know, mm -hmm. how are we going to fit into the city? And, and being in a town like Savannah, 
Um, and I say town, it's a city, but it really feels like a town. There are really these pockets of neighborhoods. People have been here for generations. They know each other very, very well. They know their, each other's parents. And, and so you really have to insert yourself in a very authentic way or you're not accepted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Um, so, awesome. yeah. So going back to the painting, did the artist know about the history of the bus station and things like that and sort of you know brought that you know along with it mm -hmm. so yeah so marcus marcus kenny is the artist's name and marcus um is a louisiana boy um but he went to scad savannah college of art and design to get his mfa in photography actually he started out as a photographer the, the scad photography building literally shares or is adjacent to the driveway that the buses use to get in and out of the bus terminal when it was operating. And at the end of the 1990s, that building was a restaurant called Cafe Metropole for a few years. And everybody in Savannah loved Cafe Metropole. Like they come into the gray, they're like, this is all right, but Cafe Metropole was the bomb. And it was like, yeah, no, it really, and Cafe Metropole was like, really easy, um, accessible Mediterranean food, sandwiches and, you know, good wine and things like that. And so Marcus was a huge fan and friends with the people who own Cafe Metropole and had been in Savannah, like by the time I got here in 2011, I think he had already been here 10 or 15 years. And so he was familiar with the history of the building. He was familiar of what it was in its final iteration before it went abandoned for a dozen years. And so he did have this very emotional connection to the building and the city. And so when he did the painting, he, you know, it was almost like we brought in a ringer and we didn't really know it until we saw um, the painting, right? Yeah, so it's a, a lot of the artist community grew up here along with SCAD. And the thing about SCAD that's very interesting, it's, it was founded, I think, in 1984. Um, and so, you, you have, you know, full grown adults that still live and work in this city that can speak to the, the past and also the present and the future. Yeah. So it's really a very interesting place to be because as small and close knit as it is, there is a level of progression, especially when it comes to conversations about race, community, and um, government, education, there are these enlightened conversations because you have a lot of um, forward thinking people in the room. Yeah. And you don't find that in a lot of small towns. Um, and so Savannah is very lucky in that way, I think. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, this is probably a good point to talk about how the hell we ended up in Savannah, the two of us, because um, I was born and raised in one of the outer boroughs of New York City, Staten Island. Um, and you know, grew up in a very, very blue collar family where my dad was a fireman and my mom was a you know, stay at home mom um, until I was probably 13 or 14 when she went and got a job um, because she was wanted to get out of the house, I guess. Um, and so, you know, Savannah's a long way from that upbringing. Um, and I'm one of five children. Um, I was the first of those five I'm, and I'm fourth in the line. So it's four boys and then we all have, we have a younger sister and I'm number four. And, you know, watching my father really work hard, you know, and do multiple jobs. Like you had to have more, you had to have two or three jobs to support a family of five on a fireman's salary in New York city in the seventies and the eighties. And then, um, you know, my oldest brother became a cop, my next brother was a fireman, and then a cop. And so I got to see like all this civil service. And, you know, in this very sort of Italian American, Irish American, white enclave, the neighborhood that I grew up in. And I was like, that seems like a lot of work, you know, like, and dangerous, like, and scary. And, and so I, my mom asked me what I was going to do after I graduated high school one day. And um, I was like, I'm going to go to college. And I told Mishama this story the first time we met him. My mother looked at me. She's like, wow, college. Can you afford that? <laughs> and I was like, and I had figured out how I could afford it by like, I was working at a gas station pumping gas at that point. And so I went to a commuter school in lower Manhattan and I became an accountant because that's one of the, they did three things well. They did nursing, 
computer science, which was really at its infancy, like this was 1985, um, and accounting. And I was like, okay, I'll be an accountant. And when I told my mother that, she's like, don't you have to take the CPA exam? And I was like, yeah, I think so. And she's like, you think you can pass that? <laughs> I was like, thanks for the vote of confidence, mom. That's excellent. Um, and so I did. I became an accountant and I, I went to work at one of the big accounting firms and, um, and then um, spent some time in Europe and, um, and LA for work and decided that I, I always kind of wanted to be my own boss. And I think that that was a vestige of my dad's firemen and sort of like really having such a hard, blood, hard work life. And so as soon as I could, I decided to like do something on my own. And I found a business partner in New York City and we started to do things in and around the entertainment, media, internet business. Like we were just, I always use the word hustlers, which drives one of my best friends crazy because we were just hustling up business. You know, we would just do whatever it took to make a buck. And it became, over the course of our partnership, it became more about the buck than the passion. Yeah. And I really, really, truly lost track of myself and why I was doing what I was doing. And so we just came to like this sort of natural breaking point in our partnership over like 15 or 20 years. And as we were going through that, Carol, my wife and I took this drive around the South and we did all of the sort of usual suspects. We started in Charleston, we went to Savannah, we made our way to New Orleans and we came back up the Mississippi Delta and the Blues Highway and we cut across Tennessee and, and saw the mountains of North Carolina, which we had never done a trip like that before. And we got home, we're like, wow, Savannah was cool. And I was really at this very sort of angsty, burnt out period in my life. And so we decided to buy like a retirement home in Savannah that we would rent out and would be part of our, our sort of our retirement nest egg. And as I was splitting up with my partner, I couldn't, I honestly couldn't bear the idea of going at it again in New York City. And so I said to my wife one day, I'm like, you know, I'm going to go down to Savannah for a few weeks and just kind of figure out if there's something for me to do down there. And that's where this idea of buying um, some real estate came up. And I saw the Greyhound bus terminal. The first, it was literally the first building I looked at. I, you know, I got a, a broker and we looked at, and I was just like, oh my God, this thing blew me away because it was this example of art modern, which is America's answer to French art deco. Um, in a city that didn't have a lot of it. So I was really attracted to the building. It took a year to actually buy the building. Um, and, um, and the day we closed on the building, I got home and my wife was down in Savannah and she's like, okay, you own this thing now. What are you going to do with it? And I'm like, I'm going to build a restaurant. And she's like, oh, you've gone crazy. You've literally lost your mind. Like you've done crazy stuff in your life, but now you're fully gone. Um, and, um, yeah, and that was my tell of woe of how I ended up here. Um, well, for me, both my parents were social workers. My dad was a Vietnam vet and he, um, you know, he served in Vietnam as a Marine. And I think when he came home is when he decided to work in a bookstore and at the bookstore was my uncle. And so my uncle introduced my parents together. My mom was still living in Waynesboro, Georgia at the time. I think my dad came down to visit him and met my mom. And I think it was love at first sight. So, so my dad says. And so, um, you know, they moved to New York together. They fell in love. They moved to New York together. Um, they were kind of back and forth because my mom was really the only child. She was one of nine. She was, uh, there were three girls six boys and she fell right in the middle. And so she was the first one to kind of leave town, not only leave town, Waynesboro, Georgia is probably have maybe 15 people there. And so um, she was the first one to kind of, and nine of them were Wes's. So she was the first person to kind of go North um, along with her brother. And I think that kind of scared everyone. And I think it scared her. So she kind of ended up kind of um, teetering back and forth between North and South. And, um, you know, they got together and they both were in school. And I think my dad finished school first and he went into social work and my mother followed suit and she did the same thing. So they both were social workers in New York City. Um, we, they raised their three children. I'm the oldest of three. And they really kind of raised us being aware of who we were and, and, and what 
what our what our contributions are and also like how we were perceived they were really conscious about being being um vocal about our class and our race um my name is mashama my brother's name is daoud my sister's name is zuwina so they sort of armed us with these names to go out in the world and prepare people to ask questions and for us to have an explanation of why we were named what we were named and um, and give a little bit of history. So I think right in the beginning, they wanted us to, they wanted to empower us with our blackness, so to speak. And they named us in that way. So we would, we would have the 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 conversation or we would have the language around it for people to you know to, to people who were inquisitive and so i think growing up i was the oldest so my parents were going to school um a lot of the time that i was in my formative years and so my brother was in um my brother's five years younger than me and my sister's nine years younger than me so i was really like the little mother i would pick them up from after school or from daycare and i would bring them home and i would make a snack and i was all, so my so even at the age of six seven eight nine i was focused on food. I was focused on feeding um, my loved ones, but I wasn't really keened into that. I just was sort of like, all right, how am I going to get out of here? And my parents were very much like education. You have to go to school. You know, they were working class people. And I think the thing that that took them to another level and took them out of themselves was education. So they were very adamant about that. So there was no question in my mind that I was going to go to college. I didn't think that there was going to be anything else. But as soon as I went to college, I got my degree in social um, in psychology, and maybe a year or two after I got out, I, it just wasn't doing it for me. It just wasn't um, free enough, and I was very conscious about being corporate, and I felt like it was selling out, and I felt like it wasn't connected to the community, and so I sort of gravitated towards working with my hands. And um, really, we had a lot of family dinners. We had a lot of um, gatherings rings, be it my mother's side of the family or my father's side of the family, there were often these sort of like passive aggressive contests about who would make the best collard greens or who would make the best salad or who would make the best whatever. And there was always sort of like these tears of who you wanted to, um, whose dish you wanted to eat at whatever holiday. And so I think that would, that competitive spirit sort of was um, innate. And I think you need a little bit of competitive spirit to cook professionally. So I think that I kind of inherited that. And I graduated college, I worked in social work and I was just like, I don't know, this isn't really for me. And I worked at a, a homeless shelter for a little while and um, I got the bug and some people were talking to me about catering and I started doing some catering and really exploring it. And um, I think the biggest, career shift that forced me to um, make a decision because I think I would still be a social worker and miserable probably if I wasn't fired from my job. So that was a big turning point for me. And I just kind of dove into the culinary arts. And so um, diving into the culinary arts, I really fell in love with it. I soaked it up like a sponge. I really wanted um, people to um pay attention to me in that way i liked it it wasn't looking directly at me it was looking at the food and yeah. then looking at me and i really kind of liked that attention it was judging me on my skills and it wasn't had nothing to do with anything else so i really kind of gravitated towards that and i went you know i did um externships after culinary school, working at restaurants downtown in um, New York City and Manhattan. Um, I traveled, I worked in France for a few months, I was a personal chef for a few years. And um, I took um, one of my mentors advice and I went back into restaurants. And that was really when I decided to hunker down and look for mentorship there. And I worked at a little place that had 35 seats and we did everything. We took out the garbage, we cleaned the lettuces. We, I mean, we did everything short of scrubbing the bathrooms. And it was the most humanizing, gratifying place that I've ever cooked because I really had to figure out what I wanted to say. And one of the things that I learned very early on, I've been cooking for maybe 
20 years now. And one of the things that I learned very early on by one of my chef instructors was if you don't love it, then don't do it. And there are so many instances in this, in this business that test that, test your degree of love and trust. And um, I think that once I realized that I committed myself to this and that I really do love it, I've kind of take the bumps and bruises as they come. And I take the, the praises and, and kisses as they come as well. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't want to do anything else, you know? And so um, when, so Gabrielle Hamilton, who owned that little 35 seat restaurant that Mishama worked at in New York City, um, is kind of a legend and a rock star in the food business and deservedly so because her food is like the kind of food that keeps you up at night because it's so delicious. <laughs> and I was reading her memoir. Um, actually, I was listening to her memoir on a drive from Savannah back up to New York, 13 hours. And so in the 13 hour drive, I was able to listen to the entire book. And I was not the person who followed chefs or knew who chefs were like, but I'm listening to this. I'm like, oh, that restaurant prune on the Lower East Side. I love that. I, I was a restaurant rep. I love restaurants. I love eating out. Like my wife and my lifestyle was, we, we were apart a lot. So we ate out alone a lot. And when we were together, we always met after work for dinner somewhere. That was just like the lifestyle. So I loved restaurants. And when I was like, oh, prune, this is the prune lady. And in her memoir, she sort of talks about a kitchen that, well, she talks about it, and I can't remember exactly the quote, but like, she's like, I don't really talk about diversity, I just live diversity, right? And so she had this kitchen that was very female-oriented and, um, and gay and straight and black and brown and white. And being in the South, like, you know, having adopted or having Savannah adopted Carol, my wife and me, and, and having this home down here, like we really wanted to be part of the community. We wanted to be contributory. I, and I thought that this restaurant, this chef-driven restaurant that I was thinking about would be contributory because the food scene in Savannah at that time um, was very sort of catering to the travelers who were coming through town. And the local restaurants were out in the environs. There was no place that was like, let's just make great food for Savannians. And I was really sort of wanted to do that. And Savannah, you know, Savannah's in the South. So it's like half black and it's half white. You know, that's a lot of the makeup of Southern cities. And so as I was sort of thinking this through, um, I, I, it occurred to me that like in order to, to create something that appealed to the most Savannians, I had to get, I had to partner up with somebody who looked different than me, who was the opposite of me. And the opposite of me in my pea brain was I'm white, I'm male, somebody black and female. And that was, so in, in listening to Gabrielle Hamilton's memoir, Blood, Bones and Butter, which I recommend everybody read, um, I was like, oh, I should, I need to meet this woman. <laughs> I need to meet her because she knows what she's doing. <laughs> and so I, you know, I, I tracked her down and she finally took a meet. Well, not finally, she was really generous. She took a meeting with me and I told her this crazy story about, you know, changing careers and was going to, you know, repurpose this, this bus terminal into a restaurant in Savannah, Georgia, and a place I had no connection to. And that I would love to work with a woman. And, you know, she seemed like somebody who, you know, just could advise me or give me a hint. And she like looked at me skeptically and again, rightfully so, uh, because I didn't know anything about running restaurants. And she's like, you know, you're a little crazy. And I want to really consider if you're crazy in a good way or a bad way. And when I come to that conclusion, if I, if I come out on the side, you're crazy in a good way, I'm going to introduce you to my sous chef, um, Mishama Bailey. And I was saying this earlier today, and then for like the next few weeks, all I could think about was Mishama Bailey. Never heard of her, never saw a picture of her. All I could think about was- He Googled me. me. And she had no Google presence. So he Googled <laughs> me. The first thing he said to me was, um, you know, I Googled you and you have no Google presence. But my only Google presence was that I ran a marathon when I was um, a personal chef in, in the Hamptons. And I came in like 147 or whatever. <laughs> Not 148. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of funny that that was the only thing that he kind of found. I don't even remember that. That's yeah. funny. 
Yeah, and so Gabrielle introduced us a few weeks later via a few weeks later via email, and um, yeah, and we took a meeting in my New York office and um, in, in my only office. That's where my office was at the time. I was still really a New Yorker at that point. And we met in New York and we, our one hour meeting turned into four hours and we just really liked each other. And I can say that about both of us because we've talked about it enough. We really, <laughs> I never put words in Mishama's mouth, but we've talked about it enough. We really just liked each other from yeah, the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it then, was a good feeling. It was, it was a really good feeling. I expected someone stuffy and old and buttoned up. And he seemed a little, dare I say, stylish. Oh. I don't want to boost his head. No, um, but I it, need it, it today. Please it, give me a little ego boost. A, you know, he was a little stylish and he tried to seem relaxed, but he was nervous. And I really liked that because sweaty I was palms. nervous. He was very sweaty. Like his palms <laughs> were really sweaty. And I thought, huh, all right, we are, because I, I kind of went into this meeting like, this was like on in Gramercy Park. I'm coming from Queens, like two fair zone, you know, bus and a train for those who don't know what a two <laughs> Only fair the zone New Yorkers is. know what a two fair um, zone is. Yeah, it's like a bus and if you get off the bus and you got to pay another fare to get on the train. So that's two fares, two fair zone. And so um, I thought, you know, I didn't really, I don't know. It's like, you want to open a restaurant, you got to have some money to do that. So we go, I go into this kind of ritzy neighborhood and I didn't, I expected to just see someone that was just the picture of that, I guess. And he wasn't the picture of that. He seemed very regular. And so um, immediately I thought we were on the same level. Like, I didn't think that he was above me and I just immediately felt like we were on the same level. So that was really comforting for me because I had never been to a business meeting before. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. Um, and so I really kind of had all these really preconceived notions and he just kind of squashed that immediately just by trying to be um, very authentic. I thought he tried to be very warm and authentic and he was very hospitable from the very beginning. He was very hospitable and that's always a good thing. I have a cousin that I love to talk about and um, his name is Harold and he shows, he's the first to show up and the last to leave and he eats the most and he drinks the most and he tells the most jokes, but he's so gracious of the hospitality. And I love having people around that like me. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, yeah. And I mean, at that point we were just like, then this like sort of six month courtship ensued professional courtship where because you know Mishama said something to me not that long ago she's like you know how many business partners just start from zero and go to a hundred like usually you know people for a while and you worked with them or you do something so we just literally spent six months getting to know each other and you know it was is Mishama going to move to Savannah um you know to do this kind of harebrained scheme frankly um and you know it, it, will she will we trust each other enough to sort of take that leap of faith with each other um and so we just like we just talked a lot and yeah. we ate out together a lot because this coming together you know over food um was was really our the thing we had most in common we both really really love food now she happens to have an exceptional palate like that i i learned in this process what makes a chef, a great chef, is a palate that mere mortals, like 99% of the people in the world don't have. But we both have a passion for food and for the hospitality and the sharing of food and, and giving people comfort um, over it. I will say that one of the things that Jono didn't know and Gabrielle knew, um, and before they met, I think Gabrielle knew this, um, was that I really had, um, I really wanted to relocate to the South. My parents had relocated down there. Um, my sister was down there. She had went for her last year of high school. I had a nephew um, that was really young. And so like my core family was in Georgia. 
And so I had been looking for a reason to move to the South. And I think that's a lot of the reason why Gabrielle thought about me because she knew that I had family in Georgia. My mom grew up in Waynesboro, which is not too far from Savannah. It's about 90 miles from Savannah. And so I think that she was kind of like putting two, two and two together. I had been doing a lot of traveling um, back and forth for different holidays and things like that when I was working at Prune. So I think she innately knew that I ultimately wanted to move south. So, and that was one thing that Jono didn't know. So it was a very, it was a big surprise to him when he found out that I, ha I lived in Savannah during grade school and that I, I was familiar with the city. And so, um, so I think that was really a, a bonus in both of our, in, in both, for both of us, because um, he was here and I had, I wanted to come back here. And so I think that that was kind of like the beginning of what was in the pot that kind of mixed it all up and got us to where we are right now. So all of that, I guess, begs the question, why did we write a book? Um, and, you know, A, I think we're both closeted writers. I think Mashama is a naturally gifted writer and I'm sort of a grinded out guy to get to something that at least I feel okay about but beyond that um you know it was like the, once we opened the gray it all kind of went whirlwind and um you know you're in the you're in the thick of it at, for you know for two years we never not worked um and it was gruel it, it, listen it, it, it's we chose it right so not complaining about it but we never not worked for those first couple of years and then in our third year, like I started to think about like just the fact that we had survived. And I'm a huge fan of another um, restaurant book called Setting the Table by Danny Meyer, who's a restaurant tour in New York City. And I thought that I thought just being there for a few years, given the fact that Mishama, her most um, highest position to that point was a sous chef in a 35 seat restaurant. And I had never run a restaurant or done anything in a restaurant before. The fact that we had made it a few years, I thought there were lessons in that. And so I wanted to, I wanted to write that down and I had been writing it down along the way. Um, and I asked Mishama like, hey, let's write a book together. And she was like, hell, I'm not writing a book. No, I'm working in a kitchen. Like I'm trying, we're, we're trying to make this restaurant, you know, better, good. And so I said, all right, I'm going to write it. And she said, go ahead, go write it. And I wrote a partial manuscript. And when um, with our agent, who was our agent, because he was really trying to get Mishama to write a cookbook at that point, and I sort of waylaid him <laughs> into this narrative nonfiction thing, um, which I swear to God, he only did as a courtesy, so we wouldn't fire him as an agent at first. <laughs> he wasn't an agent yet. That's just so Yeah, so I know, yeah. Um, and so David was like, all right, yeah, go ahead, go write a partial manuscript when you send it to me. Oh, and so funny. like, he never believed I would do it, but he didn't know me. And so I, um, they're so very good friends. By we way. all are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so David, when I sent him the manuscript, he's like, you know what, you may have something here. And so we went and sold it. Um, and the woman who bought it, Lorena Jones over at, um, 10 speed, which is Penguin Random House imprint. Um, she said, you know what, this is this is good. Um, but what would make this really compelling is if we could incorporate Mishama, you're trying to tell the story of two people with one person's perspective. And she was the one who came up with the construct of the book, which was, I write a manuscript and then Mishama overlays her points of view in response to that manuscript. And that was our first stab at it. Um, and we got it done, but we didn't get it done well. Um, and you, yeah. <laughs> Why are you trying to get over well, me? <laughs> because we, yeah, because we sent it out for like sensitivity reads at the end of um, 2019. Yeah. Yeah, 2019. I think, so the reality of it is, is that Jono wrote a manuscript and he sold it. And like he said, Lorena Jones said, you know what, it'd be better if this story is told by two. 
And I think between the time that um, he, she sort of wanted to redirect the narrative, he was very sort of gung ho about me reading what he wrote. And I think he went away, he went to New Orleans, I think, and wrote for a few weeks and sort of changed the perspective of it. So it opens differently, like it's almost completely different. I think it's still corely saying a lot of the same things, but once I became a part of the conversation and, and, and a contributor to this book, it became about our relationship. And the thing that was shocking was that it really kind of reverted me back to a safe space. Like I felt like we were making strides in our relationship. And then Jono drops this manuscript that he wrote. And it's a little bit like, all his dark secrets that I weren't really not all of them <laughs> well the ones pertaining to me and business that I weren't really I wasn't really prepared for I wasn't prepared to hear those things because I didn't know that they existed I think and I wasn't I wasn't thinking of our relationship in that way just black and white I was thinking of relationship as you're the managing partner I'm the chef we're building this thing together I didn't really see it as how race played into it. And so initially I was very um I was very shocked and I was I was reacting to this a manuscript in a in authentic way. And I think um and I wasn't open to actually discussing anything because I didn't want to be that vulnerable about how I felt about race. I didn't want to be. And so I think um that showed and so we were going to publish the book with me sort of like half in, half out, and Jono kind of like blaring his blaring at the top of his lungs how he felt. And I think we needed to reel it in, like he needed to reel in a little bit and refocus. And I needed to kind of express myself in a way that people um, would understand why I was making the decisions I was making and why I was um, why I was doing the career um, in the career that I was in partnership with him. And a lot of it was learning how to be a partner, what my voice is, what I wanted from the partnership, how I was going to grow in the partnership, and also the separation from the partnership, you know, because we don't make each other, right? Like, if, I think if, I think if we would have never met and lived our lives, I think we're better together, but I think we are both very ambitious people and we could be doing, we could be very successful in very different ways, right? And success is measured very differently. So I don't think we make each other. I think we just make each other better. So we had, I had to learn that in that process. And I think we both did. Yeah. And I think we grow, we grew um, really working on the book together because up until the point where we were first going to publish it, we never worked on it together. He wrote what he wrote. I wrote what I wrote. The editor spliced it all together. We read it. We made our comments and that was going to be the book. And it's like, well, what was the point of that? right? Like, how are we growing? And what is the conversation about? And we're actually not having a conversation about what we're writing. We're just reacting to what the other is writing. And there was a lot of that. And it read a little hostile and inauthentic. Yeah. And so I think the best thing we did was to put it out for sensitivity reads, which is a way to um, kind of which was probably a godsend for us. And it's a way to really, um, I don't know, what, how do you explain sensitivity reads? Well, you just send it out to people you know. And um, I sent it to some people I knew. The publisher sent it to some other authors. Um, Mishama sent it to some people she knew. And that first, that first final draft came back with like, the people in my world, euphemism for the white people, liked it and thought it was good. And the people in Mishama's world um, were like, no, this isn't good. You need to, you need to take, you need to take control and ownership of your voice and what you're saying. Yeah. Right? And also like, I mean, I don't know if it was control and ownership, but they, yeah, it was because it was just sort of like, you do realize that you've been crying on the phone to us for like the last six years. <laughs> so you got to kind of put a little bit of that in there too. You can't just put in, you can't just, 
you didn't just start six years ago. You got to put in the fact that you've been here for a while working towards this goal, you know, working towards what you've achieved, you know. There's a foundation that was there already for the both of us and we came together and we combined those foundations, which um, turned into where we are now. And neither one of us saw it coming, you know, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. We wanted it, but we didn't see it coming. So, yeah. So oh, I think we're at um, Q and A time, Joe. If you and don't forget, you can type those in the Q and A section or in the chat. Um, we did have one uh, about the audio book, um, and if it's going to be available in our library system. And Anne, I will put that question over to our collections manager and see. Um, you know, I know we are buying more audio books since the pandemic started. Um, so we'll see if we can get that added to the collection. So Anderson Cook, who is the director of Read SC, the South Carolina Center for the Book, and our partner for tonight's event, asks, would you change anything about your first year working together, either generally or specifically in regards to how well you know each other? Um, wow. <laughs> for me, I think what I would change is um, the kind of boundaries that were set on what we were going to do. I think that I had no idea what I was doing. I was I had I had um, restaurant knowledge, but I didn't know how to staff a kitchen. I didn't know how to run a kitchen, and I think that I was very um, malleable in the in the first year, and I think that I would change. Um, the having a voice is too fuddy duddy. I don't think it was that. I think I was, I would actually actively seek out uh, companionship and mentorship within the industry because for me, that's not, it didn't come together for me until that happened. I was sort of like riding solo, reaching out to people who weren't local. And it, it didn't come together until I started to create and, and dive into a more local network. And I think that's the part that I would change. I think I would have seeked that out uh, prior to arriving to Savannah versus um, after getting there and understanding that that's what I needed to do. Um, I don't know. I don't know that, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so because all of the mistakes. I think when you talk about would you change stuff like you're trying to make it better. And I think that all of the mistakes that we went through and all of the personal soul searching that I was doing at that point in my life and trying to figure it out um, just was you know what I what I needed to do, and um, I think if I if I changed yeah. anything, I would probably like not have come close to a brain aneurysm as often as I did because I let my temper get away from me. Um, there's a scene in the book where they plaster over the soffits during construction, and I grew up in kind of a violent household where screaming was the way we communicated, um, and and other things and like i yeah i would probably try and avoid the brain aneurysm um more often yeah for me i think that part was necessary for me my, my i yeah. needed to have um outbursts and become sort of like the worst part of myself in order to reel myself back in but um networking was really kind of I agree. The, the I, I agree. it was the hardest part for me i think it's a great question i think it's it's a hard question to answer mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but i often think like that john is always like you can't change the past and i'm like well i could do, if there was one thing i could do <laughs> and do you still find yourselves um you know finding ways to work together better you know with your partnership yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, finding new rhythms and things like that. Absolutely. All the time. Yeah. yeah. All the yeah. time. I mean, we're we're growing and we're changing and our jobs are becoming um more structured. They've always been structured, but we really, you know, we're 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 opening two places in Austin, Texas, and we both clearly have 
different agendas in order to get this place open. So we we understand that we need to communicate with one another and we need to um, make room for the work that we individually need to do in order to make this project go forward. So yeah, for sure. So not wanting to, you know, open up the debate of Northern food versus Southern food, um, but, you know, food is so very important to the South and, and, and you know, in history and culture and things like that. What, what do you think, you know, moving back here or moving to the South that really makes food and the restaurant industry so important down here? Um, and that kind of makes it stand out. You know, we're here in Decatur and they're, they're, everyone's always up for James Beard Awards. You know, we seem to have our fair share, maybe more than our fair share sometimes people think. Um, but, you know, there is a clear love for food here yeah. in the South. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just, you know, your observations working in the industry and what you see maybe the differences between that sort of like North and South food. Um, I was in New York City and there, of course, there are um, farmers of all sorts, right? There are, you know, uh, cattle farmers and, 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 and vegetable farmers and oyster farmers. But I, in, in my experience, I found that New York was very purveyor based, right? So you would buy your meat from, we bought our meat from a butcher shop and in, 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 um, on the Lower East Side. And we use um, a little herb shop, a little spice and herb shop in Alphabet City. And we would use Chef's Warehouse or certain things. And we use um, um, Peerless for our seafood. So it was very sort of purveyor based and those purveyors had their represent, reputations. And in the South, I think it is very, um, farm based. You are, and I think that's why a lot of places are coming up. You know, a lot of places in Atlanta, Atlanta is surrounded by farms. There are goat farms that have great goat milk. There are one of the farms that was here called Sepalo Farms relocated to North Georgia. We miss them very much. But those, 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 those farmers are, have direct relationships to the restaurants. And I think that's a little bit of the difference for me because when I when we first opened, we were trying to figure out the purveyors. We got nailed um, for doing a suckling pig. We used <laughs> one of our, I, it's something I did in New York a thousand times and I come to the South and the first thing I wanna know is where's that pig from? What farm did you get that pig? Oh, we got it from this very respectful purveyor. They did not care about that. They wanted to know like whose uncle I bought this pig from. And so I think that that is a little bit was the shift for me that it was it, the South is really about relationships to where you get the food from. And New York is about connections. And so I think that um, that was a, that was the biggest thing. I think that's a big difference between. And then when you deal with the farmers, then they give you things that they're growing personally for themselves because they've kind of like they're like, well, I don't really like this, or they're like, well, we grew too much of it, or really it just kind of took its own, it took on its own life. So now you're working with sort of like this indigenous ingredient that you didn't even think that you were going to have that isn't readily available. So you have this special on that you know you can really kind of wow people with this kind of, you know, low quat plum that grows in someone's backyard or these sour oranges that only grow for a month and then they're gone. So no one's farming them, but you have like this neighbor of yours that is selling you these things. So it, it's kind of like relationship based, which is really um, the South, right? You sit on your porch and everybody weighs high when they go to the mailbox and when they drop their kids off at school and in North, in New York City, uh, if you, cocktail hour. yeah, in, in New York City, people talk to you. They're like, you're like, what did you say to me? Yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's excellent. So um, we have a question from Deborah Wiles, a uh, young adult author, lives here in Atlanta. Her, she has a new book out on Kent State. Um, we know you're doing two restaurants in Austin, but she asks, what's ahead for the gray and ahead for the two of you? Um, well, I mean, we have a lot on the plate right now with the two places in Austin that are opening. Um, 
You know, I'm going to, nice to meet you, Deborah. I, I'm going, I'll answer that kind of metaphysically. I think finding our, finding, you know, sort of that work-life balance and, um, and coming to peace with who we are, you know, as a restaurant, as owners, as partners, um, you know, you, the gray is so personal to me and I believe to Mishama. Yeah, me too. Like it's, it's almost like it's impossible not to take everything personally um, about it. And that gets really, really wearing on your soul in a lot of ways. And, you know, I don't know, like putting a book out, it's like, you know, you're, you're, coming to terms with the fact that, you know, people are going to shoot at you and that you're a target and that, you know, the reviews Yelp and like, I got to get over all that shit. That's what, that's, what's up for me, <laughs> um, you know, in the future and grow the business for our team, because in order to motivate people, you, you have to be moving in a forward direction. And our team is very, very important to us. Um, it's important. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, that, I don't know, Deborah. I hope that, I hope that was a good answer. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of piggybacking up on, on what Jono said about Yelp and reviews and ownership. And we had this like really grueling manager. Meeting we had a very today. stressful manager meeting. And I think that, you know, and, and, and a part of it, like one, a person, you know, one of the managers suggested that we change one of the services we're doing. And then, and, and it's just like, we're still figuring it out, you know, and we're still figuring it out because it's been very distracting. You know, we just, 2020 was extremely distracting. Um, the way we kind of been shot out of a cannon is really distracting. And so I think that there, I think that when you think about restaurants and I think Jono and I, one of our goals is for our restaurant to be notable. And in order to be notable, there is this, uh, there is this kind of, um, you, there needs to be a reputation behind that. And in order to build a reputation there's longevity. And so we're, we're growing and we're only six years old and we're still trying to figure out what works for us and what doesn't work for us. The space is a big part of the narrative for us. It's a bus station and it's big <laughs> and the restaurant, the walk-ins are in opposite size of the space. So figuring out um, good ways for the cooks to be productive is really kind of like this battle and it's, all, it's this conundrum that we face on a yearly basis and, and retaining staff because um, it requires a tremendous amount of energy because we're busy and um, people are exhausted and it's hot. And so it's like, we're still trying to figure a lot of stuff out. So I think that, you know, we'll, I think there's more to learn and, and we'll, we'll get yeah. there. And Austin, I think is going to teach us a lot. It's going to teach it's going to empower our team um, and it's going to teach us how to work more efficiently, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Survival's the answer, Deborah. <laughs> Deborah says, great answer. Uh, thanks you all so much. And she can't wait till it's safe to get to Savannah and have a meal of the gray. Well, oh, um, yeah, Deborah. I'm looking that. forward to seeing you. If we come to Savannah and have a meal of the gray, what is on the menu that we should not miss? Oh, let me answer that because I eat there <laughs> way more often than Mishama does. I'm on my way there after this to audition a server. Um, you know, the one of the greatest bites of food I think that maybe we've ever had on the menu um, is this pickled oyster dish um, on a saltine cracker, like literally a saltine that you get, you know, at um, the grocery store with um, some lardo and chicken skin cracklin. Um, and it's like, it's a perfect, perfect bite of food. Um, the country pasta, which we serve in the diner bar and for brunch, um, which the recipe for is in the book um, is, it's, it's a riff on pasta carbonata, but it's 
like the thing you kind of want to eat three meals a day of for me. Um, but Bashama's food's craveable. Uh, and I say that objectively because I can only think of three or four restaurants on the planet that I crave the food from when I don't get it. And the Mishama's food is one of those. It's just like, it sets up great for people who love food. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> <laughs> We're dealing with this guy. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 have you ever like, uh, you know, tried something, put it on a plate, put it in front of him and it's like, you know, I, yeah, I don't take too much stock in that. I think that he, I think of, I was. This is the beat up on John O' part of the evening. No, it's not. No, no, no. When I like it, I like it, you know? And I think that. Um, we very rarely. Sometimes I have to convince him that it's, it, it, it's a thing. And, and it works mostly. There are a few things I think I can count on one hand that he never comes around to. Um, but I think for the most part, he's like, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. convinced. We yeah. very rarely disagree vehemently on a dish. Like right now, the bacon we're using at the <laughs> market, I am so against because it's inedibly salty and we're going to have to work that one out. <laughs> we're going to change it. I've been kind of keeping it to myself, but we're going to change it. <laughs> so there you go. That's the breaking news. <laughs> Changing breaking the news, new bacon because yeah. um, it's too salty. Yeah. We have a comment from a guy named John. He said he visited the Gray in October. Jordan was his waitress, and Mashama took a social distance picture with him and his wife. Um, as a Morehouse grad, he loves the history, uh, and he's still dreaming of the Lima Beans. Yes. You're welcome back anytime. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if Anybody has any final questions before we, we close up shop this evening? Because it sounds like John needs to get to the restaurant. Uh, <laughs> Marriott read and loved the book. Uh, thank you for taking the time and care to tell your story so honestly and generously and for taking the time for this conversation. Um, congratulations on the expansion. I've been dying to visit since seeing Mishama's episode on the chef's table, now even more so. Thank oh, you. thank you That's so much. Nice. Yeah. Well, Shama, John, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Once thank again, all would like to order a copy of Black, White, and the Gray. Karis Books is our bookseller this evening, and you can click the link and um, order it from them or any bookstore locally, depending on where you're joining us from. Our bookstores have fought so hard during the pandemic. I know. Yeah, they have. Home, curbside yeah. pickup. Some of our yeah. books are delivered at home. And we also encourage you to support Black-owned businesses because those are very important and vital to our communities as well. We'd love to thank Anderson and everyone at Read SC, the South Carolina Center for the Book. We have many more of the On My Mind programs coming up, including programs with Karen White and Anjali and Jetty for her new book as well. We thank you so much for allowing us into your homes this evening, and we will see you all very, very soon. Thank Thanks you, again. everybody. Thank you. Have a, Have a great night.